We never know what a piece of wood's really going to look like until we actually put the finish on it. Well, today we're going to find out on this 1903 A3 stock, finally, what it's going to look like because today we're staining it and oiling it. I want to start by saying I'm not a big fan of stains and I'm really not that good with them. I just prefer the natural beauty of wood. This tool cabinet here behind me, this is cypress and cedar, that's it. And there's tongue oil on it just to seal the wood, that's it. And with beautiful wood, why would I want to cover that up? But there are times we need to do stains. And some of you are absolutely just artists with stains. And like I said, there is a time for it. Well, this is the time for it right here. This 1903 stock. Whoever, and I've mentioned this before, but this, is, this will be the last time you can actually see clearly what was done to it. Whoever on this whoever sporterized this rifle, the stock, they spliced in a piece of wood here for the pistol grip. There was no pistol grip here originally. It was straight stock. And the fitting they did on this was just outstanding. Well, we can actually see now that I've stripped off the stain that was on here that they applied, we can really see the different woods. It's a lighter color wood in places, it's a really close match on this side. It's a lot lighter color on this side. And this top piece here. Okay, they added this section from here up also. So they did some serious work to this stock. It made it much more functional. All right, this gave us a much higher piece of wood for our cheek weld. They raised the comb up significantly. And there's also less felt recoil with this particular stock after what they did by raising this because it, it got the butt of the rifle up. And the 1903 Springfields were famous for having a lot of felt recoil just because they had so much drop at the cone. That goes back to black powder days. Well, that didn't work too good on high pressure cartridges, or at least it didn't feel too good. It worked well. <laughs> So they did a lot of work here. Well, I need to apply a stain just to blend all this in so that it doesn't look like a lot of pieces of you know, spliced together walnut. Not to mention when I was doing the sanding on this stock. I could only do so much sanding in certain places, for instance, the bottom. I couldn't remove too much wood because we have bottom metal that's going to have to go back here. We need everything to fit and flush and all that good stuff. Yeah, there's only so much I could do on the sanding. Other places I did more shaping, so we went a lot deeper, did a lot more sanding, went a lot deeper into the wood. Well, now it's a lot lighter color in those places. So it's, there's a lot going on with this stock. Not to mention it's a lot of years old. It's pretty much 80 years old at this point. This particular rifle was made in 1942. So it's been around a while. A lot of oil in it, uh, just a lot of years of use. What a, to make this look like I, I want to make it, we need to put some stain on here, and that's why I'm not going to do just an oil finish. But for the time being, I need to do a little experimenting to come up with something with the stains. I'm going to try mixing a couple for the stock. And I added the ebony four-end tip. This is a piece of the original four-end tip, and right here where it it gets narrower. That's where the the barrel band originally went on the military stock. This was a military stock. So I cut that end off and I started not to. I loved the, the character it added, but I did want a, an excuse to work with ebony. So I cut it off. Well, we got us a few little test pieces out of this. I cut it in half and we got a few test blocks to try some colors on. 
And just on a side note, when I was reading James Howell's his section on stains, he mentioned the different types of woods. All right, well, we know we've got maple, cherry, hickory, walnut, oak. All right. He got a little more specific, and this goes back to him being so much more knowledgeable than me. He mentioned the different types of walnut, and he didn't just say European walnut. For him, he, he talked in depth about the differences between English walnut, French walnut, Italian walnut, Corsican walnut, and I don't even know where that's at. I'm going to guess Turkey, or at least Turkish walnut's famous now. And he talked in depth about American walnuts. He, he talked about Texas walnut, Kentucky walnut, Ohio walnut. And he mentioned specifically that the walnut, almost exclusively, all of the walnut used by Springfield Armory on, say, 1903 Springfield, it came from Mississippi bottomlands. And Mississippi being a southern state, the trees grow a lot quicker. Well, and so much water it being bottomlands, the wood's very porous. And he talked about Mississippi walnut being very porous and it would rapidly absorb stains. Smart man. Again, he makes me feel bad every time I read anything out of here. And makes me feel spoiled. He made his own tool. But anyway, so that explains part of why this was so dark because it's, it's old, it's dry, and it's very porous to start with and it's sucking up every bit of stain. So we're going to see if we can't come up with a concoction between a couple stains here, try it on our test piece to see if we can't get a color that works. Now before I get too busy concocting anything here, I want to wipe this stock down real quick with some mineral spirits. first color I want to try is literally it's called gun stock. It's men black and when I say mix the stains, it, these are, I'm using two stains primarily. The red mahogany which just came out almost black on my test pieces and then the gun stock. The gun stock is so much redder. These two put together might give us exactly what we're looking for. And keep in mind, these are old base stains. You can mix old base stains. And I'm going to go over all of this with bold linseed oil. I could mix the, these, since they're old based and this is an oil, I can mix these things with bold linseed also. But I'm going to try to keep this as simple as possible. <laughs> and just go with the stain just to cover up what we need to cover up on the stock. And we'll apply this to our test pieces. Even the gun stock stain on this old walnut, the way it's soaking it up, it's more than dark enough without adding the red mahogany, which would just make it that much darker. So, all right, we have our stain. We don't even need to make a concoction. We're just going with the gun stock. One thing I do want to do to the stock before we put the stain on is apply a pre-stain conditioner. And what that does is it keeps the stain from coming out splotchy. And it's something that can really help out with really porous woods. Well, we know this particular walnut's really porous. And not only is it porous, but we've got different pieces of walnut in here. Well, they're going to absorb stain at different rates. That's why you end up with splotchy wood from stain. So we're going to apply this. And J James Howe mentioned this also, coming out with splotchy stains. He recommended using water. And we really want to put this on here heavy and let it soak in. I also taped off the ebony. Now we're ready for the stain. And honestly, I'm kind of terrified at this point. I put a lot of work into this. 
I don't want to have it come out ugly with some stain that just ain't right for this wood, which is why we did the test pieces. I think we're going to be okay. And I could cut this stain down, mix it 50-50 stain and mineral spirits, and then it wouldn't get as much color. But we need the color to cover up the, the places where the stock was spliced together. So we can go back with darker over top of this. I'm, I'm a little worried it's going to be too red. And on top of white oak, it's really red. But it is a pretty red, so let's see what we get. Oh, it's red, all right. <laughs> it's coming out a lot brighter on the stock than it did on those test pieces. Now I want to wipe off the excess. I let that first coat of stain dry overnight. And I must say it does look pretty good. We've got a lot more red on the end here where the wood was lighter. And then we're darker in this area. And on this side, the pieces that were added, like the pistol grip that spliced in, it's starting to blend really well. But if we flip it over, Okay, the lighter pieces of that wood that was added, it still stands out. And if I keep applying that uh, gunstock stain, which has a lot of red in it, it's not very dark. And it, even with it not being very dark, you can see we're still dark here. This, my test pieces didn't lie completely. This wood is dark. And it's the original walnut that's so dark. If we keep applying that gun stock to this, it's just going to get redder and redder, and we want it darker. So what I did, I took the gun stock stain with a lot of red, and then I took the red mahogany, which is really dark, and I mixed the two roughly 50-50. And what I'm going to try, I might be messing up here, but I'm going to go back on over this area with that mixture and see if I can't darken this up to get it to match this area so it doesn't really stand out. And I've got a piece of test wood here that I, I use this both to stir up the stain, but this is white oak. So I can really see the pigments well in this as far as what colors are in here. And for that gun stock on this, you can see just how much red is actually in it. It has a lot of red. And on the red mahogany, I don't know if men wax messed up on this. I don't see a trace of red pigment in it. So it is, it is dark. It's pretty much black. Maybe when it reacts with the wood, it gets more red. I don't know, but I, yeah, this looks like early American. It's just, that's almost looks like ebony. It is dark. But by mixing the two, and I use my test piece here to see what the mixture would look like on top of the red. I think that's going to give me what I'm looking for in this area. So we're going to go in right now. We're going to paint this over. I say paint. That's basically what stain is. And see if we can't make this blend. Get it a lot closer to the surrounding wood. I let the stain dry that we added to the pistol grip and to the comb, that darker stain mixture we came up with. It helped it. It looks good. It really blended it in a lot better. Especially this side looks great, which is a closer match on the wood color anyway. We can still see some differences here, but it's 
It's about as good as I'm going to be able to do. Somebody that was really talented at this could match it up to where you would be able to tell a difference. And whoever did this stock originally, they had it really close. I, I think that's going to be where I stop at as far as just these pieces. And now I'm going to go over the entire thing with a final coat of stain. And what I did, I, I took that mixture we came up with, the half gun stock and the half red mahogany, and I added more of the gun stock to it. I don't want it as dark now. Now that we've got these darker, the lighter pieces darker so they match better. So we'll go over the whole thing with this and we're going to call it good. Now a little side note, when you put dark stains on top of light color stains, that's what gives the appearance of a lot of depth. When you see some of those custom buzz loaders that some very talented individuals are still making and they just, you can see the depth in that finish and they're just gorgeous. It's because they've used so often, I mean, there's different ways to do it, but so often they've used starting with a light coat and then going to a darker coat and working their way to that, that final finish. So I think us starting with the gun stock on here and then working our way to the, this final coat I think it's going to give us a lot more depth on the finished product here. And I'm glad I added that gun stock to the, to that mahogany because we're getting, now we're getting that really nice, rich, deep red that, that just looks so good on a rifle stock. That last coat, as good as it looked going on, did not have the desired effect. This side looks great. This is our problem side here. And what happened is the area that was added, the comb, it made it a bright red and then it made the existing wood more of a dark brown. So I came back in over, over the last few days and I added two more coats to the new wood on the comb. The pistol grip looks great. And I added some color in there too also, redid it. But I've gone with two more coats on the comb and it's still not what it, I would like for it to be, but I've done all I can do with those two stains. I can find something with more brown in it and start experimenting there, but I think at this point, I just need to take what we got and move on. I don't need to do any more experimenting. <laughs> I'm afraid of what I could do it. So this is what I could do to it that I wouldn't want to do to it. So yes, yeah, we got a little difference in shade here, a little more red in the top, more brown in the bottom, but we're going to call it good and go with it. We're putting oil on it now. This, this is what we're going to end up with. So let's see how this is going to turn out and let me get this masking tape off of the ebony. For our actual finish, we, we've got a lot of different options. We could go with polyurethane. That's what's on most of the new rifles, the factory stocks, and it's really good looking finish. Look, almost looks like glass. Polyurethane has a lot of advantages. It's extremely tough, it's durable. The downside to polyurethane though is if you get a scratch in it, when you get a scratch in it, because you're gonna get a scratch in it eventually, even as tough as it is, to get that scratch out, you have to strip the whole stock down and refinish the entire stock. That's the only option there. Then we've got all the oil finishes. The advantages to most of the oil finishes is that with the oil, 
you can sand out a scratch, just that scratch, and refinish just that scratch because the oil will blend, the new oil that you apply will blend with the existing oils. You can't get that with poly. All right, and then with your oils, there's so many oils to choose from. There's um, Mark in the comments section. He kind of, me and him share a similar philosophy, which he's a huge fan of Tungle. Well, I mentioned this cabinet here behind me is Tungle. I, I, Kind of like it myself. Um, Mark Novak, who does the Anvil videos, does some outstanding work, and he's a big fan of Danish oil, which is similar to Tungle. Mark mentioned it also in his comments. All right, there's True Oil. Uh, most of you have heard of that at some point, which I've always heard True Oil was just a version of linseed oil with some additives to help it dry a lot quicker, but then I was recently told, no, it's not, it's actually not even really an oil, but I, I don't know. But Mark said what I've always thought, which is for a working field grade firearm, boiled linseed oil. Well, that's what this is going to be, is this is a working field grade firearm. So, boiled linseed oil, I think it's the easiest to maintain, and what I'm doing now, the reason I got 400 grit sandpaper. The reason I was sanding this is because I want the sawdust from this to fill in the pores in the rifle. I didn't use anything to seal the pores with. Well, you don't need to with bolt and seed oil, can you? We're going to sand it in. I believe the process is called sand dust filling. So it, the pores are going to get sealed off. Okay, that looks really good on the spot I was worried about. That Once we get this oil on here, I, I don't know that we're going to be able to tell a difference between the, the pieces on this new wood and the old. Okay, I'm happy about that. Now I'm going a little liberal with this boiled linseed oil right now. Just because this wood still, even though it's got the stain on it, it's still very porous. And I'm going to sand this in. But the biggest danger there is with boiled linseed oil as far as messing it up is using too much. Because right. then your drying time just, oh, it can take forever to dry. And I mean absolutely forever. So that we really want to be careful of that. I think that's going to give us what we want right there. So I'm going to go over the entire stock with the, the oil. I'm going to sand the entire stock. And then I'm going to rub it in by hand. And I, I'm going to get it hot. I mean, literally, my hand's going to be, with the friction on the wood, it's going to be hot. And that's because we're actually going to force that slurry of boiled linseed oil and sawdust into the pores. And when you've heard the term, a hand rubbed oil finish, this is what they were referring to. And just like that, we have a hand rubbed bald linseed oil finish on this rifle. And it does look pretty good. You can definitely tell the difference in the, the woods, but even on the pistol grip, it's starting to become more obvious that it was spliced in there. No, the backside again, where the colors were a lot closer to start with, it's more difficult to tell, especially on the comb piece, but you can sit in the pistol grip also. This will darken up over time though, and it'll blend a little bit better, I do believe then, but it is what it is. So. I wanted to make it blended as well as I could with the stain so that hopefully 
you couldn't tell a difference or it'd be very difficult to, but I did not achieve that, at least not yet. And I say just like that, we have a boiled linseed oil finish. It's not quite just like that. Okay, we've got the first coat on here and I have rubbed it in thoroughly. But we've got four more applications or three more with the sanding. All right, so what I'll do is I'll come back every week and I'll put a very thin coat after this on here and sand it in just like we just did, rub it in to get those, to get that slurry of sanding dust and oil really down in those pores of the wood. And I can still see we've got some open pores. You, if you look at it just right in the light, you can see where the pores are, the open pores. And they run with the grain. So you, when you rub it in, you want to rub with the grain. So I'll come back a week, 10 days, do the same thing again. And then it's once a week, every 10 days until it's bone dry. I'll wait till the existing coat is absolutely just bone dry, put a new coat on, and then three more coats. We'll call it good as far as for the sanding part. And then I'll cut the checkering into this. After that, we'll go over everything with a couple of finished coats, again, a week between coats. So, I think this is one, part of why so many people don't care for the boiled linseed oils. It just takes so long. That turned out pretty good there. And out here in my shop, as warm as it is, it's not going to take that oil long to dry. And I have to say, the, that stain took a lot longer than I was expecting. But I don't know why. My projects always do take longer than I expect. That's part of the learning process, though. And I learned some stuff on this one that'll help me with the next project. We learn by doing, and it's all about learning. And something else to keep in mind, and I'm going to get a little political here. I tried to stay away from politics, but since how tomorrow is Memorial Day, I thought this was fitting. It takes a lot of work to create, and to build, to maintain, but it's easy to destroy. Anybody can destroy it. That takes, that's, no effort. Turn a three-year-old loose in your living room with a baseball bat and see how that goes. Right, well, here in the southern United States, the Confederate memorials, destroying those, that's become a controversial issue over the last few years. Well, something to think about on that is the people that want to destroy them, what's motivating them? What is their motivation? Now, I know why they say they want them destroyed, and it's because of why they say that the memorials were built to start with. But their reason as far as why the memorials were built, well, they're either wrong about that or they're just lying, or maybe both, I don't know. And as far as why they were built, that's simple, they were memorials. Keep in mind the war between the states. More Americans died during that war than in World War I, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam combined. In my county alone, over half the male population died in that war. Now think about that for a moment. Is it really that difficult to understand why those widows and mothers and daughters, cousins, nieces, Ants, why they would want to build memorials. Is it, is it really that hard to understand? Anybody that can't understand that, I just don't know about them. Okay. They put in a lot of work to do that. And I say widows and daughters and aunts. Most of those monuments were built by the United Daughters of the Confederacy and various other women organizations of the time. Those are the ones that raised the money to have those memorials built. And they did it through bake sales and um, a couple counties away from here. There was a memorial removed out of the cemetery of a Presbyterian church. The women raised money to have the memorial built by selling hand-drawn 
drawings of Confederate graves. Three cents a piece. Think about the work they put in to raise the money to build that memorial. What do you think their motivation was? You think it was hatred or something like that? Anger? No. We don't build and sacrifice like that out of hatred and anger. The only thing we do out of hatred and anger is destroy. Now, think about the people who are wanting to destroy those monuments. What's their motivation? Who are they trying to honor? Something to think about there. And any political issue, if you want to know what somebody's motivation is, are they trying to destroy or are they trying to build and create? Uh, you answer those questions and that, that'll get, help you as far as figuring out what their motivation is. Okay, and the reason to mention all that. Those same women, that's why we have Memorial Day. A Union general, he saw women placing flowers on the graves of Confederate veterans that fell during the war. He said, well, that's a good idea. We should do that for all of the fallen soldiers. Okay, that's, that's where our Memorial Day came from. And that's what it's for, is to honor all of the fallen soldiers. Anyway, there's some stuff to think about there. And I, I do want to encourage all of you to take a moment tomorrow and stop and think about the sacrifices made by so many. And what I said about it, it's, it's not easy to build or create. How many died so that we could build this nation? They sacrificed everything so that we could have a nation. Now, how many are trying to destroy our nation? Think about the memorials. Think about all the sacrifices people made to build those memorials. Now, think about all of those today trying to destroy those memorials. And generally, it's the same ones trying to destroy our nation. Not, not in every case, but... Uh, a lot of it is. Uh, anyway, just something to think about. And yeah, please, please do take a moment to to think about all those that did sacrifice their lives. And ride by some old cemeteries. Uh, those organizations, they're still out there. They're still working to honor those that gave their lives. United the Daughters of the Confederacy. The sons of Confederate veterans, the daughters of the American Revolution, the American Legion, so many organizations, they're still working to honor those that sacrificed their lives for this nation. And then when you ride by some of the old cemeteries and you see the American flags out there, you see the Betsy Ross American flags, you see the Confederate battle flags here in the South, all of those flags are on the graves of veterans put out by the various organizations remembering those veterans. Take a moment to ride by a cemetery and think about what they sacrificed for this nation. Whether you agree with their politics or not, that's a whole different subject. One thing you can argue though is they sacrificed everything for their state and or their nation. God bless and Y'all have a wonderful day and a solemn Memorial Day.